Welcome to another episode of Lux Home Tour. I'm Jennifer Pfaff Smith, and I'm the Miami, Palm Beach, and Naples Homes Editor at Lux Interiors and Design Magazine. Today, we're going to dive into the cover story of our current Miami edition. This is a very unique project. It's actually a guest house in Key Largo, and it consists of three two-bedroom cottages, all elevated off the ground and wrapping around a pool. So joining me today to talk about this special residence is the designer herself, Andrea Goldman. Thank you for being here. Oh, thank you so much for having me. So the way I understand it is the client has owned um, a vacation home in Key Largo for a while, and it, she has this huge extended family. And so her property really wasn't big enough to host everybody comfortably. And that's how this project came about. Tell me more about the idea for this guest house and how she envisioned it functioning for her and her guests. Uh, sure. So yes, the client um, actually, they had built the main residence a number of years prior to us doing this project. And at the time um, it was um, a couple and um, they always had discussed, they have three grown daughters that are married um, with each of them with multiple children. And uh, the thought was always that if the property directly adjacent to their existing um, uh, residence became available, that they would make an offer. The intention was the home that they, the main residence, it was lovely and, and large enough, but certainly not adequate to accommodate if everybody wanted to be there at the same time for a holiday. Um, and so it was a, it was a long time. Um, it was a process that took a while where they always, you know, were hoping to maybe acquire the land and build something that really was more for fun and sleeping and less for the entertaining component of it. So, you know, you mentioned that the, the main house had, had been constructed a while ago, and this was done by uh, Clemens Bruns Shaw. He's a great architect up in Bureau Beach. I understand the main house was also done in kind of a Bermuda style. And so there needed to be a dialogue between that property and this one. I kind of get the idea that the average person really might not understand a difference between a Florida home and say a Bermuda one, and maybe they both look kind of tropical to them. So tell me about, you know, the nuances the differences between these and, and the built environment that you were working in? Uh, sure. So, I mean, I probably, um, Clem, he can speak to this better than I can, but <laughs> my understanding is um, it, it's a, a confluence of uh, the Caribbean and European and American. It's a, it's a um, the, the, the roof line, even what your, your background right now, which is the interior, but yeah. <laughs> um, it, the actual exterior roof line, it's, it's a tiered white roof line. It's kind of, as he describes it, um, like a, a, a tiered cake with frosting on it. Um, and the, the structure itself is really more crisp white walls. Um, and in detail, like you're seeing behind you, it's a lot, of, there's no drywall. It's all wood and painted wood, some pops of color on, on the fabrics, textiles, um, so most of the, the, even the upholstered pieces, even the outdoor uh, furniture, it's all white. And then we have just punches of color and it's typically a, like a turquoise or a bright blue that we like to use. Mm -hmm. um, but so it was, the, the main house is, is honestly, that was the beauty of this is that it, it was so well done and the client um, for good reason loved it so much. It wasn't just taking like notes of the existing house, it was literally repeating, but in a different program. So it was, you know, we, he ended up absolutely using the same plumbing fixtures, a lot of the same tile, you know, different details in the bathroom and the main house are also in, in the new house. So um, it really was just pretty much, they wanted to feel like it was almost conceived and designed at the same time and that it was not in addition. Right. Got and it. he was very successful at that. Clem is, he's, he's brilliant. He's good at what yeah. he does. Yeah. <laughs> and so, you know, for your role here coming on board with the interior design, you know, again, it was about creating a, a Bermuda style and not a Florida one. So I get the impression the owner didn't want to feel like she's in Florida, but really right. just more of like a vacation mindset. So how do you interpret that? What does that mean for you and for your role coming on board here? Sure. I think that, you know, um, the client was very clear that, and again, it was easy. I had a nice roadmap from the previous residence. I, I, it was a, 
it didn't um, take long for us to kind of wrap our head around where we wanted to go with this. We just wanted to if uh, honor what was already created and, and do our thing, of course, but certainly um, not mess up a good thing. Uh, <laughs> but they, you know, Florida and you no know, knock on Florida, they just, it was really clear. They did not want seashells. They did not, they don't want certain things that maybe are, you know, palm trees on a, you know, on a fabric or a, a little bit more of a typical Floridian um, right. interior palette. So, um, you know, that was something that um, it, we knew just to kind of steer clear of those things. Mm -hmm. um, and also the client and her husband, they had done quite a bit of charity work in Africa. Mm -hmm. So they already had in the main property as well as just within, you know, their, their homes that they have, um, some textiles, some, some accessories, um, some small pieces of artwork that were more African influenced. Uh, Ghani, I think was where they initially had done a lot of uh, work with bringing water and hospitals and um, schools to the area and then also Nigeria. So um, they're just a remarkable family. And so that was also, there's a bit of that influence going on. So it definitely has um, some of the textiles that we pulled have mm. a little bit more of, a, of an African um, and Caribbean you know, combination vibe. But otherwise nothing so literal that screams yeah. chows per se. That's <laughs> correct. correct. Exactly. So what's really unique about this property is that it's, it's mostly bedrooms. You know, you have six bedrooms in this house. And so you came up with um, a really great repetitive strategy to make sure that you know each one was beautiful and had the same um, accommodations, but but they're all different in terms of character and personality. So so walk me through your attack plan for these bedrooms so that you know one of them isn't like the best and and no one's playing favorites here. How did you handle it? Well, that way you hit exactly what was the what the main goal um, and directly from the client was that all three families, um, their daughters and, and their husbands and children would feel if they came here at the same time, that they were all equally weighted. Nobody wanted to feel like they, <laughs> they drew the short straw um, with their, with their, um, their accommodations, which of course is not the case at all. The property is beautiful, but so it's, as you described, it's basically three pods of two rooms. So there's a pod per family, not that they can't change it up every time they come, but there was a thought that every family would have their own pod. Um, and, and so we wanted to make certain that, that every room felt special and unique enough, um, but also it was fluid and felt like it was still all, the rooms all worked together and connected if you were to walk from space to space. So um, playing off of what I kind of was describing earlier where the, the palette is bright and white to an extent, we then in these bedrooms decided to um, actually put pattern on the walls. This is the only place, the main um, area that you get that's behind you, you know, there's, there's no wall coverings. It's really what right. you're seeing. Um, the bedrooms, we decided to have a little bit of fun. So um, Philip Jeffries is a, a vendor and a partner that we love to work with. And we um, exclusively used wall coverings from them and some of which we actually custom colored existing patterns. Um, mm -hmm. But every room has its own kind of unique personality. And that was the jumping off point was the wall covering that we chose to put in each space. Yeah. Uh, and then we also, uh, Urban Electric is a company that we also love to work with. Yeah. And at every single bed, there are reading lights that are the exact same reading light, um, <laughs> but we were able to color, custom color the back plate and the shading of each light. So every room had its own personality within the reading light as well. So we took certain details like that and repeated it in every space, but um, definitely changed it up as far as the color palette, played a little bit with the rug, even the furnishings, of course, everything is, you know, is unique. Right, right. That's great. <laughs> fun. You, fun. you also had to find ways to maximize space because, you know, like we're talking about the bulk of this property really is bedrooms. There's um, one large living area and then there's a tiny kitchen, maybe even consider like a kitchenette, really. Yeah. You know, this isn't the place for a lot of cooking. This is where right. it grabs takeout and kind of just gathers and has family game night. So how do you maximize space in these gathering areas as well, these common areas? Sure. 
So that was something that was very intentional and in that we worked um, closely with, with Clem's office um, on exactly that, you know, knowing that if they were really there for a Thanksgiving and they wanted to spread out and have a meal um, at one table, it wasn't going to be happening in, in this, in the, in the guest property, it would be happening in the main residence. So um, they, you know, it was important that that one space that you're talking about, really it's the sitting area behind you and then it's open to a kitchen and you're right, it's not a large kitchen. There's not um, a ton of storage. Uh, mm -hmm. So we wanted to make certain that of course there was island seating, like, you know, as much as we get out of the island because that really serves as the table in the space if somebody really wants to be sitting at a, at a, at a surface that feels more like a table. Um, and then directly behind the island, and it's the console behind the sofa that you are showing in your image, um, we made certain that that also was deep enough and long enough to accommodate comfortable, kid-friendly, you know, water-friendly food <laughs> party, right? Um, stools, so it's kind of like back-to-back -back dining. So if they want to be snacking or actually really having some kind of meal, it, was, it would almost serve dual purpose. It's really meant to um, to snack or have a fast, you know, bite, but then yeah. enjoy the outdoors or go to a restaurant and let somebody else take care of it for you. So. Exactly. Take yeah. the golf cart and go Exactly. <laughs> yeah. That's so, amazing. you know, I imagine most projects you work on, there tends to be like more than one gathering space. There's often, you know, a large dining room, a large right. living area. There could be a TV room. There could be like a, another sitting area. And this one was mostly bedrooms. Right. And so, Obviously, that's the hugest difference, I would imagine, for this project compared to the others in your portfolio. Right. So was this one in any ways like more challenging because of that? Or was it maybe a little easier because of that? How, do, how does this stand mm -hmm. out to you, you know, when you reflect on it? Sure. I mean, challenging in, in, the, in the way that it was just, it's unique. But it was also um, really rewarding and fun because because you were able to just really kind of only focus on, you know, what we just discussed, that main room, we knew how that had to function, but we wanted to make certain the bedrooms, mm -hmm. if you just didn't feel like hanging out with family for <laughs> an hour or two, <laughs> that the bedrooms really were a respite or an oasis in themselves, that you, not to be antisocial, but just to take a break and feel like you could be comfortable in, in the bedrooms. Um, and so, you know, it, it's a, not that we don't in our in our main in our our typical projects where there is multiple spaces to live in that you still want a bedroom to be comfortable, but there's a little different. You know, we we had to think about if somebody wanted to do work in a bedroom because they had to do a little work while they're on vacation. Where does a laptop go, and is there a surface room? You know, someone to to do that while they're there, or um, it had to be ample room that you could really sit and lounge in there and read a book or watch. They all have tell you know TVs. They, so it's really that's where your private time is happening is in the bedroom. Um, and then we also, you know, lucky, uh, Florida, you know, Florida's not Chicago. So we were able to really take advantage of, um, all the pods in the main space, they surround a pool. Um, right. the, the main residence has a really smaller, like almost like a plunge pool. This is a larger pool and on the, at the, at the guest quarter. So, um, we did lots of seating, outdoor seating. Um, as well as a kind of little cabana, like a semi covered cabana where you can snack and hang out and play a card game or you know just hang out together as a family that you maybe wouldn't be able to fit and do in the main living space. So we had to really make certain that whatever spaces that existed, we were we were always thinking of it dual purpose, not right. just enjoying, you know, lounging, but also what other functions can come. So it was fun. It's a it's fun to be able to think out of the box. So it really is. Yeah. <laughs> Last question. Yes. Let's say you're going back to the property as a guest again this time, but now you're staying in the guest house. Yes. Which bedroom are you picking? I hope I get asked. I love <laughs> to go back. Of course. Uh, so, you know, it, that's a great question. I, you know, I was discussing that with my team that that worked um, on this project with me. And when we left it, right after we installed it and handed it over to the homeowner, um, we, we sat around a dinner that night and kind of, you know, hypothetically, if we were in this, in this, what would be your favorite, um, your favorite bedroomer? And I love that everyone at the table picked a different bedroom, which was amazing. Um, and certainly though, the one that I resonated the most with me was probably the most serene because that's just more of my personality, but there's a, one of the rooms has a really beautiful, 
um, kind of soft green uh, wall covering. That's a Philip Jeffries, and the rug is is like a like a a white fluffy rug, and it's just it's just a lot of texture and some soft color. And I mean, that would be my absolute you know dream spot to, to wake up um, in that room. But honestly, I I, I would be perfectly happy in any one of those bedrooms. Well, they all look cozy. You can't go wrong with any of them. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Andrea. This was so fun to talk about it. Thank you for joining right. me. Yeah, thank you for inviting me. Thank you lots for featuring it. I really appreciate it. Mm -hmm. Bye. Have a good one. Bye. Have a good day. Hello, I'm Helene Oberman, Managing Director of Interior Design Magazine, and i like to welcome you to Product Tour. Energized by a passion to push the boundaries of excellence, beauty, and innovation, for over 50 years, El Dorado Stone has been creating stone veneer that incorporates 
yet modernizes those qualities first produced by Mother Nature. The focus of the brand is on humanizing spaces and accentuating the connection between the built environment and the outside world. And with their deep understanding of the latest market trends, El Dorado Stone is crafting products right here in the United States to fit the needs of you, the designer. With me today to discuss the brand is Sarah LaGrasso, Director of Marketing and Product Design. Welcome, Sarah. It's really lovely to have you today. Thank you, Helene. So happy to be here. So we are here today to talk stone, and that's veneer, of course. And I'm not sure if everyone is actually familiar with the El Dorado brand, and I would love if you could provide us with just a little insight into the history and the mission of the company. Yeah, absolutely. Um, El Dorado Stone is a national brand. Uh, we've been around for over 50 years. Um, previously known for the most believable architectural stone veneer and our latest push has really been, like you're saying, to kind of humanize the brand, really accentuate the spaces where we work, play and live every day. So you've been with the company for the last 15 years and given your role leading product design, of course, you've always stayed on top of the latest market trends. And I really would love to hear from you, how have you seen the needs of the designer really change during that time period at the company? So I think, you know, design is always ever changing and evolving. And, you know, you're seeing the shifts in design styles, you're seeing the natural shifts that occur in color palettes, but we're also seeing, I think, the shift in how people are living in these spaces every day. And the, the activities and kind of the um, personalities that are coming out in those spaces are being much more incorporated into the design as well. So of course we're seeing um, you know, natural shifts with styles and profiles and textures and color palettes, but we're also seeing a much bigger push of personalizing a space and making it you know, more comfortable or inviting to that person that's living in that space day to day. Well, with your product, of course, there's really no better source of inspiration than Mother Nature. So would you say that you're really capturing what the best she has to offer and modernizing it? I think we are. I think we are. I think I'm confident to say that. You know, I think the human spirit has a, a natural tendency to seek connections with Mother Nature and want to be surrounded by it. I think El Dorado Stone as a brand, as, as a company, does our best to replicate the, the natural textures and the nuances and the characteristics that come from Mother Nature. And then when getting into you know, developing the color palettes, Mother Nature is the best source of inspiration for that. And we try to incorporate those into the color development. Um, you know, with the design trends kind of evolving and changing to some of these lighter and brighter color palettes, we're, we're not chasing just monochromatic colors. Um, there's, there's natural undertones and currents of accent colors that are subtly involved in the overall color development that still allows the profile to have some movement, some depth, um, and give it a much more relevant appearance um, when incorporating it into your design today. So I would love to know, because especially as we're talking how you're developing these color palettes and of course the texture profiles, beyond Mother Nature, I mean, do you have other sources of inspiration that you really look to that really helps with that development? Um, I mean, absolutely. There's, there's inspiration everywhere. You know, it could be a piece of art. It, it could be, you know, absolutely a natural element that we may find outside. It could be, you know, um, a material, a textural material that, that, you know, has a beautiful color palette or, or a beautiful, um, you know, sheen or something to it that we're going to pull from it. You know, we found inspiration based on, you know, personality traits that come through some of these designers or, or, you know, within the A&D community that we collaborate with. So all of that, I think, lends itself into the development and kind of inspiration of products that we're developing. So, you know, speaking to the a and community, which you're very well connected with, have you found, especially in this last year, that conversations that you're having with designers and really what their needs are have changed? Absolutely. I mean, I think if you, if we're addressing potentially this last year, you know, post-pandemic, I think a lot of the 
changes that are occurring are surrounding the form and functionality of, of your design in your space. Um, you have a lot more layered elements that are happening when you're talking about, you know, work and, and play all in the same environment. So I think a multifaceted design is what we're seeing kind of come through when people are looking to how do I, how do I design an office that can also be used for, you know, potentially online learning or how do I do a living room that can also accommodate, you know, X, Y, Z, other elements that would be pulled into it. So I think some of the shifts that we're seeing are a multifunctional role in spaces, um, either how to create some separation within those spaces, how to create definition between those spaces. So I think some of those shifts we're seeing and, you know, we're certainly looking, um, you know, to create products, you know, in a sense of what's happening right now where, you know, stress may be over mounting. Um, we're looking to develop products that when incorporated into your space can bring you a sense of calm, potentially a sense of sanctuary, you know, open up, you know, a, a brighter area kind of color palette that might make you feel a little fresh or clean. Um, you know, I think we're seeing little bits of that kind of shift where it's not so centrally focused just on the product itself, but more of how that product is integrated into the overall design of the environment. So, you know, it's come up a couple of times now in the conversation, but of course, sort of one trend that we've been seeing um, definitely over the last year across a lot of different categories, especially in architectural materials, is this like the shift to wider, brighter tones. And so like, how are you seeing how that's being incorporated to some of your newer products? Um, two of which are Grand Bank, Slide and Stone and Lower Valley Rough Cut. Absolutely. I, we've seen that shift coming down the pipeline for a few years. Um, and it's actually, I mean, it hasn't gone away. If anything, it's gotten stronger. I think there's, you know, a natural appeal to something that has a, a, a brighter color palette that can reflect light, it can make a space feel bigger, can make a space feel airier, you know, maybe a little lighter, maybe a little cleaner. Um, it certainly creates a beautiful backdrop to other accents or elements that are going to be involved in that space to let some of those, you know, furniture pieces or art pieces still take center stage. Um, you know, you're referencing the Grand Bay limestone and the uh, Lower Valley Rough Cut, those are products that what we were seeing is there was an uptick in a need to want to incorporate traditional stone shapes, such as those. Those are typically traditional stone shapes. And what the designers were looking for is a modernized color palette. So we created these lighter, you know, kind of airier color palettes that are not flat white. They, they have accents, they have grays and rust and, you know, a little bit of, you know, blondes that are integrated into it so that it doesn't feel so flat. You absolutely still have that tactile appeal, you know, that's going to come through um, with the textures and the color palette as a whole. So it, so it's, you know, aiding in kind of that overall aesthetic of that environment. So white is not just white anymore. So how are you able to really create that depth of color though? So that even that one can't even find in mother nature herself. Yeah, I mean, you know, the, the craftsmen that are on our team that are part of the color development, you know, the process is it's layers and layers of coloring within our products. Um, so it's not like you're saying, it's not just a flat white. It's not just white as white, um, you know, there's, accents and undertones of other other colors that are layered on the products um, and what that does as a whole it is it allows your eye to kind of move across the installation or the application and kind of pick up on some of those nuances and it helps to kind of create a little bit more of a story it helps to create some depth a little bit of personal characterization that you would find in a natural material and I'm just curious because, you know, our audience are designers and designers love process. So how long does it take to really develop something like those deep tones and shifts in color that you can find in the limestone and rough cut? You know, I mean, it takes months and months of development. Um, you know, there are some times where we're much more successful at hitting the colors that we want. There's other times that we need to trial and trial until, you know, we as a team feel that we've got it right. Um, but I mean, I think for us, when we know we've got it right, it's a much faster, easier process. 
there's limits that we have with replicating mother nature. You know, we, we certainly strive to get as close as we can to some of the natural colors that you will find, but we're also pushing the boundaries a little bit with some of these more modern and contemporary colors that you may not find exactly the same in mother nature, but to try and meld some of these color palettes together um, is what is helping us kind of modernize uh, you know, true color palette that you would find out in mother nature with still hints and touches of, of contemporary palettes that we would see, or we would want to see in, in design spaces. So I really love this like sort of dichotomy then that you're producing. So if you're thinking about Grand Banks limestone and the Lower Valley rough cut, which you, you spoke about a little bit is like, maybe they're, they're more traditional texture profiles, but then you're taking these really modern color palettes and sort of bringing it together to make it much more contemporary sort of for, you know, obviously for modern day settings. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, you know, there is definitely a need for I, that, that we see from the design community that they want to be able to incorporate a natural material. And I, I think stone is one of the best materials to incorporate into your space. But, you know, you may not want your clean lines, you know, potentially if it's coming off either a little too contemporary or a little too cold, they still want some of that warmth that they would find from a natural material or even just some of the character that you would find in the shapes and textures of it. The limestone and the, the rough cut are beautiful examples of a very traditional profile. Um, and we were seeing that the more that we were kind of toying with the idea of these lighter, brighter, more modern color palettes, it really started to resonate with that design community. Um, and we were having designers take some of our old, our older profiles and they were whitewashing over top of it because they still wanted that look of that traditional stone, but they just needed a brighter color palette. So, I mean, we've had beautiful inspiration from the design community has led us to this collaboration of some of the new products. And I think, you know, I think it absolutely will be a trend that continues forward. So something else you really touched on um, earlier in the conversation was this idea of well-being. And certainly there's been a greater emphasis on health and wellness of inhabitants within a space. And with that comes sort of this, this push for biophilia and how it's become an even more important design tool that's being utilized with interiors. So, so obviously I know you speak a lot about sort of these benefits of incorporating biophilic design within an environment. Yeah, I mean, I think that topic specifically, I am, I am so eager to speak about. I think I'm really drawn to it because it has such a personal and humanized kind of sentiment to it. Um, we all love being surrounded by nature. I think, you know, if, if you were to ask yourself when you're walking on a beach, how does that make you feel when you are on vacation and you're in the mountains? How do you feel? I think there's indirect natural biology that's happening to us that creates a calm, creates a, you know, a sense of happiness, you know, does it reduce your stress? Do you feel, you know, like you've created a sanctuary? And I think taking all of those benefits and being able to incorporate that into your day-to-day -day environment where it may feel a little bit more hectic, a little bit more chaotic. Um, I think having somewhere that you can retreat back to or even having something that's tactile where if you rub your hands on it, you know, do you have this pinch of nostalgia that may happen that brings you back to a vacation or, um, you know, do, does the color palette, you know, kind of just make you feel good or fresh or, you know, I think the, the biophilic subject is, it's absolutely more important now than I think than ever before. Um, we're a little bit more kind of stuck in our homes and stuck in our spaces. And so to be able to take the outdoors and bring them in and have them provide true benefit to you in your everyday space, I think is, is extremely valuable. Well, definitely. I mean, I'm going to get limestone or rough cut because, you know, don't we all want to be like in Europe right now? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Travel. But no, <laughs> but I love this idea that you keep on coming back to, which is this idea of sanctuary, especially given the fact that, you know, our, our homes have been become so multifaceted, multifunctional, and it's like, you need to work, you need to live and play, like you said, but like, where's our time 
for like that sort of mental and physical and emotional rest. Right. It's absolutely right. necessary for everybody. Absolutely. Absolutely. There was an article that I was reading that was talking about kind of the psychology of um, clouding in your space. And, and it was saying, you know, with technology now, you know, you're, we're on computers, we're on cell phones. I mean, your eyes are naturally so busy. Um, like you're saying, you have multi layers of things that are happening on your everyday when you think of work and kids and life and things to do and, and whatnot. And um, this article was beautiful because it talked about giving your eyes relief and the trigger that it's almost like a snowball effect that when your eyes have relief, it, it is a trigger effect that can start to affect kind of your heartbeat and it can start to, you know, create a calm within yourself. So, and, and, and again, that touches onto some of these cleaner, you know, more muted color palettes give a natural visual relief um, to your body. You know, some of these clean lines that you may see kind of come through give, again, just relief um, visually. And so I think, you know, some of those things absolutely are going to play a hand in design when, when people are, you know, creating beautiful new spaces, I think they're absolutely going to start looking to how can you create kind of this sanctuary or this retreat that you that you need to create in your own space. No, I mean, I think we all can admit that we need a little respite from staring at technology and like, but better. So of course, incorporating, you know, you know, we've talked about for biophilia, there's the natural light that can help with that. But also, so incorporating greenery like you have behind yourself or stone which we've touched on but I, I know something uh, you know I would love to let the audience know is like obviously your, your product offerings go well beyond the stone veneers and you actually have great collections like something like Vintage Ranch which celebrates the character of like the classic American barnwood right so it's right like, there's there's a lot of different opportunities given what products El Dorado Stone has in your portfolio. Absolutely. Absolutely. And Vintage Ranch is, is the profile that we developed a few years ago and it has been booming. Um, you know, I mean, that barn, the, the, the farm wood kind of barn house look absolutely has been a trend and it's beautiful. Um, and we've continued to expand development on the Vintage Ranch profile. Um, but again, yes, that, that's emulating a, a reclaimed barn wood um, look that you can incorporate into your space. And because it's produced out of a, a concrete material, it lends itself to more spaces that you can utilize it in where you wouldn't necessarily be able to utilize, you know, wood within your, within your spaces. So um, again, and, and, you know, the, some of the characteristics that are captured within the vintage ranch are just stunning. You can literally run your hand across it. You can feel kind of the milling marks. You can capture some of the graining that's in it. Um, it really is a spectacular product to incorporate into any spaces. So it's interesting because the barn one makes me think of this, this next topic that I really wanted to bring up, which is because you know, we're speaking about residential spaces and they've really become highly personalized over, over time, um, especially in the last year, because I think we've spent just so much time at home, but you have this, this ethos that you really like to call, which is lived in luxury, which I think kind of feels like it ties into that barnwood kind of idea. And I would love to know what lived in luxury means to you. For me, and this is probably strictly for me, um, and and I, hopefully someone else resonates with this. I have two kids at home, and my my job, my occupation is is to develop products and develop things that are incorporated into you know beautifying or, or designing a space. And it's oftentimes difficult to balance having beautiful things with kids or with family, uh, you know and I think lived in luxury for me is, is being able to kind of capture both of that. I want to be able to be surrounded, you know, by luxurious elements that are able to kind of create a, a focal point or a showcase, you know, in my home, but I also need it comfortable enough to where I can live with my kids and I can live with family coming over and dogs. And so, you know, for me, lived in luxury is kind of the balance of both. Um, it's the juxtaposition of having old and new, 
um, into, you know, developed into the same space. It's taking a deeper dive into what are the textures and the materials that I want to, you know, utilize in my space. I don't want anything that is going to feel so cold or so stark or just too off limits to where it's so beautiful, but don't touch it. Or it's, you know, it's so, it's, it was designed so well that I can't, I don't want to sit on it. Um, I think lived in luxury is, is trying to harness both of those kind of I, I, you know, ideas and bringing them together in the same space. So, you know, I think it's, it's really about creating a space that works with you and works for your environment on a design side, but also making kind of the form and functionality of it work with your every day so that you are able to enjoy the space that you just created at any point, you know, within your lifestyle. I mean, I love the fact that it's like, it's, it's nothing is too precious, right? And it's really about this idea of accessibility and comfort. But, you know, as I was sort of thinking about this idea, it made me think of like, is lived in luxury sort of the shabby chic of the 21st century? Right, right. I mean, and, I mean, I think so. I think it is kind of your shabby chic. I think it's, it's absolutely, you know, and this is just my, you know, our coined mm -hmm. term of it. It's not anything that, you know, is out in the design world. It's just a different dialect that, you know, we could put a name to. Um, but absolutely, it's something that, you know, I think more and more people are going to want to pursue, you know, to be able to have nice things and have things that, you know, shine and, and, and sparkle and make your place, you know, everything you want it to, to be, but also carry that personalization into that space because, you, you are, you have a life, you have things to do, you have, you know, things that will happen in that space and to be able to make that work in the same environment as, as where you're wanting to, you know, create this beautiful artistic piece. I think it's really important to kind of marry both of those together. So really, you know, for designers to figure out how to really personalize either their spaces, of course, their clients, you know, and to really simplify the specification process, you've created some really great useful tools to really help them figure out what is the best El Dorado product to fit their spaces. Yeah, um, if you visit our website, eldoradostone.com, we have a variety of, of tools that designers or consumers can use. Um, we've got a visualizer space, which is a visualizer tool that you can go in and you can use any of our existing environments and you can play around with different products. You can also upload your own photo and then cast uh, any type of products that you want in your space so that you're able to really visualize what your space would look like in a, in a different, uh, you know, a, a different variety of product options. Um, we also have a ton of mood boards that can show different styling of how materials play together, how different color palettes may play together. Um, and then we also have a very large library of inspiration images that can walk you through a variety of applications with a variety of products um, so that you're able to get a sense of, you know, what is attractive to you. Um, and then once you drill down to kind of the product level, we also have a product selector that's on our website that you can click through and click into the style and get down to a category of style, you can click into the types of lines that you are looking to create um, in a shape, in a, in a texture, and then you can pick your color palettes. And once you've kind of finished that questionnaire, it'll populate some options that are suited for the, the style or the um, inspiration that you're looking for. So a, a, a large variety of different um, tools that someone can use to kind of narrow in their focus on what they're looking for. No, I mean, I love that you made it really simple and especially offering a lot of the, the inspiration behind so, so that the design community understands it. And something that, you know, we should make very clear too is that, you know, we've really been speaking about residential spaces, but, you know, you have tools and obviously products that actually span both from residential, obviously, to the commercial world as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, we've got content that is surrounding commercial applications that's showing, you know, our products that that is being used on on larger applications um, within the hospitality world within, you know, the multifamily um, within retail, I think we've got some great examples on there. Um, 
And all of the tools that we're talking about can be used for both residential or commercial. So they still lend themselves to both you know, kind of applications. Um, the Inspiration Gallery has a section on there that is strictly commercial focus. And we're always continuing to expand on that library to be able to show you know, with people the diverse kind of collection of how you can use stone veneer in a project, both small and large, both, you know, residential and commercial. So it's absolutely um, a growing asset that will continue to nurture. That's great. Well, Sarah, you know, obviously today was just only a little, a little dive into the world <laughs> of Dorado stone, but, you know, I really would love to thank you obviously so much for your time and for the insight that you've provided. And of course, for our amazing, lovely audience out there, please make sure to check out the El Dorado Stone website to learn more about their products and of course their inspiration and specification tools. Thank you. Welcome to another episode of Lux Home Tour. I'm Jennifer Fapp Smith, and I'm the Palm Beach, Miami, and Naples Homes Editor at Lux Interiors and Design Magazine. We recently featured a cover story in our Palm Beach edition about a Juno Beach residence with a certain je ne sais quoi. <laughs> it's a beach home, yes, so there's plenty of coastal style, but there are also touches of French provincial sensibility for a look that is traditional, warm, and inviting. Today we're going to hear more about this design with the interior designer herself, Krista Alterman. Thank you for being here. Hi, Jennifer. Thank you so much for having me. I'm super, super excited to be part of this with you today. <laughs> we're, high, we're excited to have you here. I'm really um, looking forward to hearing about this. So I understand that you met the clients through the general contractor, Matthew Montgomery, and they told us that they knew within 10 minutes of meeting you that you were the right person for this project. That's a pretty immediate connection. What did you all bond over in terms of design for this house? I, when I read that, I was like tearing up because it's something that we dream about. I think as designers, having that connection with a client is something that you just want, you crave because it makes a project run smoother. It makes it enjoyable. And, you know, this is a relationship that we're in sometimes for a year or two. So you want to really you know, I don't know, like each other from the beginning. It's like dating um, in that way. And, and so we, we did really have that something in our chemistry that brought us together that made us really excited about mm -hmm. working together. I think one of the key elements there was we're both from the Northeast. They're from Rhode Island. I'm from Connecticut. Um, I used to vacation in Rhode Island when I was a little girl, so I had great memories of that. And so that was kind of how we sort of started to hit it off. And we just had a respect for a variety of design elements and architecture right off the bat, things that we loved and, you know, bonded on. And so I think that that was really exciting. And that's always the best feeling because people can be difficult. Clients can be difficult. And having a wonderful positive experience is everything. Of course, it makes the project that much more meaningful, of course. <laughs> so naturally we see a lot of beach houses down here, a lot of coastal style. It, it makes a lot of sense for the area, of course, being in South Florida. But these clients, like you said, were a little different being from the Northeast and they wanted more of a Northern beach look. So tell me about how does that translate to you as a designer? What are the differences between sort of a Northern coastal look versus something we might see here typically in South Florida? Well, we definitely, um, I was involved with the home from the very beginning. Um, and that's a great question, actually. You can kind of tell from the front elevation of the house that we merged sort of like Georgian and almost like federalist architecture because there's a flat front, you know, there isn't a lot of um, ornamental details in the home. So it's very kind of early American to a degree, 
But then we added the two front porches, which make it a little bit more of a Southern home. Mm -hmm. um, that, so mixing those two styles together gave it that kind of Northern and Southern sensibility. And I think that makes it for, makes an interesting approach to the house. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you get that sense right from the get-go, from the minute you walk up to it. And I understand the clients were drawn to historic homes, like the old beach houses of Rhode Island, where they're from, like you mentioned. And so to give it that personality, you had a ton of fun playing with millwork. Tell me about how you used millwork to infuse that character and give the house more of like this lived-in vibe, even though it's new construction. Oh, that is such a good question. First of all, I just realized you're sitting in the house. Where I am. <laughs> Behind you, that's amazing. Um, I love that. Mm -hmm. Yes, we did. So there is, you know, there's a difficult design challenge in making a new home feel historic. Mm -hmm. So yeah, one of the first things I decided was all of, you know, my aunts and uncles homes in the Connecticut countryside always had lots of millwork, shiplap, beadboard. And, you know, that historically was put on a wall to protect it because walls were built out of plaster historically. So they would put millwork or wood on the actual walls to protect them from getting cracked. And now we use it decoratively and I used it all over this house. We did, you know, horizontal shiplap. We did vertical shiplap. We did high, we did low, we did wainscoting. We did it on the walls, on the ceilings, you know, everywhere we could to really give it that character. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think every room has a little Krista Alterman millwork treatment to it, a little special piece there. <laughs> yes, even the hallways. <laughs> yeah, that's right, they do. So another key part of this design is the clients were drawn to French country architecture. And this, I understand, had you reminiscing about your honeymoon, which is in Provence. So what you know, memories came to mind for you that ended up translating into the design of this house? That I, my husband and I honeymooned in Aix-en-Provence and I loved everything about the not only the architectural there architecture there but also all of the sort of beautiful fabrics and you know the Provencal fabrics have this, these beautiful colorways and these thematic um, elements to them uh, there's there's leaves and lavender and you know all this beautiful I don't know layering of texture and intricate details and that was something that I loved and always try to use whenever I can in my homes. But when I do a historic home like this, where we're trying to bring a little history and a little bit of the French and the Italian into the design itself, yeah. that was something that was really important. So I tried to, I mean, being on your honeymoon is an amazing experience, obviously, for obvious reasons. Of course. Mm -hmm. I'm actually sitting in my master bedroom and behind me is a wall of our, my husband and I, our vows are on our master bedroom wall, believe oh, it or wow. not. So I love him. And I try to sort of bring those elements of one of the most amazing trips of my life into my work. because that makes my work more fun. Mm -hmm. <laughs> all the more personal. And that's what gives a home all, all the more character is when it reflects the people who live there. Totally. So this house notably has a very clear blue and white color palette, but it doesn't feel stale or trite. It's actually very fresh and invigorating. So what were some of your tricks for making the design still seem interesting while still playing within this limited color palette? Oh, well, thank you for that. That's a nice compliment. <laughs> Um, layering is always key, I think, to making a home feel more, I don't know, feel more like less like a house and more like a home and something when people really love a certain color palette and they don't want to veer too far from that, mm -hmm. then it's really important to layer in other elements that will give the home depth. And mm -hmm. that is wood textures, metal textures, um, mm -hmm. A variety of we used a lot of baskets and we used a lot of found elements um, things that were found in you know flea markets and all of those types of things that kind of layer in the personality mm -hmm. and 
you know, makes it a little bit more complex as opposed to just a blue and white house. So um, a really special feature of this home is the fumed oak flooring. And I understand these planks undergo this amazing process for them to be darkened and sealed. I'd love to hear more about this. And, and how did you discover this flooring too? It's just so unique. Well, this is where our reps come into play, right? Our artisans, people that we work with that are experts in a variety of areas or certain fields. I have a wonderful company that I use for most of my homes because they tend to have creative product, you know, product that maybe not other showrooms have. And, and I loved when I went in and saw this flooring and then he started to talk about the story behind how it's processed. And it's actually wood, oak that's left in a room or a tank with ammonia. And the ammonia to, just creates the tannins come up in the wood and create this beautiful wood texture that happens completely naturally just with a chemical you know, um, reaction. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, what's cooler than that, right? Um, right. So, so when he told me about this fumed oak flooring and how it's made, I said, we have to have it because it's, it's not only beautiful, it's naturally sealed and it's created in such an interesting way, it makes for a great story for the homeowners too. Absolutely. And another cool thing about this home is that even though it's got this traditional backdrop and it looks you know, older than it actually is, it's actually a really smart house. And it's got all this modern technology inside, like these touch pads that you don't see. Um, and that's what's kind of neat too in adding to the historic feel because old homes, for instance, would have would not have outlets. And so you're able to hide it using this modern technology. Tell us about some of the, the cool features that we might not see in photos, but that the owners get to experience. I love that you know about this and you're talking about this because my client is a technophile. So everything, he wanted everything to be accessible through his phone or through a, a touch screen. Mm -hmm. And that was such a design challenge for me because I had to have these screens all over and like, how do you how do you put something super modern into a beautiful millworked wall? So yeah. that took so much work with me and um, our millwork artisan and you know our contractor regularly going to site and making sure, sometimes retrofitting things just to see that it doesn't mess, you know, or I don't know, take away from the beautiful design features. Uh, so yeah, that was a challenge, but I rose to the challenge and I, I took it on and it turned out awesome. Thank God. <laughs> yeah. You, you can't tell at all. You can't see them. <laughs> yes, it was, it, we worked long and hard on that. So thank you. I'm glad that you noticed that you don't <laughs> notice anything. But what we can see, what's really obvious in this home is that this is totally meant for indoor outdoor living. This house has, you know, multiple terraces. There's a roof deck with ocean views. There are these floor to ceiling sliders that go out to the pool deck, which really is a destination of its own. So with all this going on, you have all these outdoor spaces on top of indoor ones. How do you make sure that everything is cohesive and flows together and, and isn't too busy at the same time? That's another great question, Jen. Okay. <laughs> Um, I want to know. <laughs> I know. I love it. I love your curiosity. Um, it is, it's a design challenge for, for, you know, Floridian designers to create outdoor rooms that feel like indoor rooms, you know, because you want to have lush seating and beautiful fabrics and colors and everything, but they have to, they have to withstand the elements, the Florida elements, which are not easy on, um, you know, furniture and fabrics. Mm -hmm. So the way we really did that was smart choices, high quality furniture, creating that opening, the, the opening of the entire back of the house mm -hmm. makes it feel like it's another room because it feels like it's part of the great room. And then what I added too was I added all the French doors at the front of the house too, so that we get these beautiful cross breezes in there. It's magical when the doors are open and you get this beautiful ocean cross breeze. It's like being on vacation. So phenomenal. 
<laughs> makes you want to be there right now. <laughs> Far. <laughs> that's right last question Krista how is this project different from others that you worked on you know when you look back on it what stands out to you there's so many things it's it is one of my favorite projects for a variety of ways um, I loved the homeowners so much as we talked about mm -hmm. I loved you know just being challenged to create a home that is not only classical, but can function in the modern age. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, this was really a home that COVID built. It was built during the height of the pandemic. And that was a challenge for me because I was doing, I was really present at every meet, site meeting. I had to really be par intricately part of every detail in the home. And, and that was, that was really something that took a lot of time and a lot of love, you know, and it really turned out to be my favorite house for so, so many of these reasons. Mm -hmm. And I feel ever connected to it and always will. So it's in my heart for, for so, so many reasons that I do tend to sort of look at my portfolio every once in a while and go through the pictures because it gives me a warm feeling, you know? <laughs> well, that's, that's the best possible outcome you can have. And we were so thrilled to feature it on a cover. Thank you so much, Krista. This was so great to catch up with you and learn more about the story behind this design. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. I enjoyed this so much. <laughs>